As their stolen alien ship hurtled through the cosmos, Sarah Chen and Mike O'Brien were riding high on the adrenaline of their daring escape from the galactic penitentiary. Sarah, her hair still slightly singed from rewiring the ship's control panel, was gleefully examining the vessel's systems. Mike, meanwhile, was inventorying their hard-won supplies, which consisted mainly of alien food paste, a suspicious amount of something that might have been toilet paper, and enough sporks to outfit a interstellar cafeteria. You know, Mike said, holding up a spork and admiring how it caught the light of a passing nebula. I never thought I'd say this, but I'm starting to develop a real fondness for these things. Sarah laughed, not looking up from the ship's navigational array. I told you they'd grow on you. Who knew the most versatile tool in the galaxy would be a combination spoon fork? So Mike said, putting down the spork and moving to the co-pilot's seat, what's our next move? I mean, we're free, we've got a ship, and the galaxy's our oyster or whatever the alien equivalent of an oyster is. Sarah's face lit up with that now familiar mix of excitement and impending chaos. Well, first things first, we need to find a way to contact Earth, let them know we're okay, and maybe warn them about the whole aliens are real and they have space prisons thing. Mike nodded thoughtfully. Good point. Though I'm not sure how we'll convince them we're not crazy. Hey guys, we escaped an alien prison using cigarettes and sporks doesn't exactly sound believable. True Sarah conceded. But that's a problem for future us. Right now I'm more interested in figuring out how this ship works. I mean, look at this technology. It's decades, maybe centuries ahead of anything we have on Earth. As if responding to her words, the ship's control panel suddenly lit up with a series of flashing symbols. A soft, melodic alarm began to chime. Ah, uh, Sarah Mike said, eyeing the flashing lights warily. Please tell me that's just the coffee maker finishing a brew cycle. Sarah's fingers flew across the alien controls. Not unless this coffee maker runs on antimatter and is about to go critical, she looked up, her eyes shining with a mix of excitement and mild panic. I think we might have accidentally activated some kind of experimental drive system. Before Mike could respond, the ship lurched violently. The stars outside the viewscreen stretched into lines, then swirled into a kaleidoscope of color. There was a sound like the universe hiccuping, and then, silence. When the psychedelic light show faded and the ringing in their ears subsided, Sarah and Mike found themselves staring at a sight that made their recent prison break seem like a casual stroll in the park. Before them loomed a space station of truly staggering proportions. It made their former prison look like a quaint bed and breakfast in comparison. The station was a masterpiece of alien engineering, all sweeping curves and impossible angles, studded with lights that pulsed in patterns that seemed to defy normal space-time. Surrounding the station were hundreds, if not thousands, of ships of various sizes and designs. Some looked like they'd been designed by a committee of drunken abstract artists, while others were so sleek they seemed to be made of liquid metal. Ah, uh, Sarah Mike said, his voice tight. Where are we? Sarah, her hair sticking up as if she'd just stuck her finger in a cosmic socket, blinked rapidly as she tried to make sense of the readouts on the ship's monitors. Well, according to these instruments, which I only partially understand, we're either in the Andromeda galaxy or we've shrunk to the size of atoms and are currently floating between the nucleus and electron shell of a hydrogen atom. Mike stared at her. Please tell me you're joking. Sarah shrugged. Hey, you wanted to explore a black hole. Consider this an upgrade. We're exploring the unknown. Before Mike could formulate a suitably sarcastic response, the ship's sensors began to beep urgently. Sarah's eyes widened as she deciphered the alien symbols flashing across the screen. Oh, she muttered. Oh, Mike repeated. I don't like, uh, oh. Uh, oh, is what got us into this mess in the first place. Sarah pointed at the view screen. Remember how I said we might be in the Andromeda galaxy? Mike nodded warily. Well, good news, we're definitely not inside an atom. And the bad news. The view screen lit up, zooming in on the massive space station. Hundreds of smaller ships were now converging on their position. Sarah grinned weakly. Looks like we crashed someone's party. As if on cue, the ship's communication system crackled to life. A booming voice speaking in a language that sounded like a cross between whale song and a dial-up modem, filled the cockpit. Sarah and Mike exchanged glances. Any idea what they're saying, Mike asked. Sarah shook her head. Not a clue. 
but judging by the tone, I'd say it's along the lines of unidentified ship, you done goofed. The voice continued its incomprehensible tirade, growing increasingly agitated. Suddenly, the ship shuddered as a tractor beam locked onto them. Well, Mike sighed, out of the frying pan and into the, whatever the hell that is he gestured at the looming space station. Sarah was already fiddling with the controls. Don't worry, I've got a plan. Does it involve sporks? Not yet, but give me time. As their ship was inexorably drawn towards the massive station, Sarah managed to activate the universal translator. The alien voice suddenly became clear, mid-sentence. Repeat, you have violated the sacred space of the galactic conclave. Prepare to be boarded and processed for judgment. Mike raised an eyebrow. Galactic conclave? Sounds fancy. Think they'll have whores do evers? Sarah ignored him, her mind racing. Galactic conclave? Why does that sound familiar? She snapped her fingers. Of course. I overheard some guards talking about it back in prison. It's like the United Nations of the galaxy, where representatives from all spacefaring races meet to discuss important matters. Like what to do with humans who keep escaping supposedly inescapable prisons, Mike suggested. Probably Sarah's eyes gleamed with that now familiar mix of excitement and impending chaos. But think about it, Mike. If representatives from all over the galaxy are here, Mike caught on. Then someone might be able to help us contact Earth. Their moment of hopeful planning was interrupted as the tractor beam deposited their ship in a cavernous hangar. Dozens of armed guards, each a different species, and all looking equally annoyed, surrounded them. Okay, Sarah said, taking a deep breath. New plan. We go out there, explain our situation, and hope that intergalactic diplomacy has evolved beyond shoot first, ask questions later. Mike nodded, then paused. Wait, should we bring the sporks, you know, just in case? Sarah considered this for a moment. Better safe than sorry. Grab a handful. And so, armed with nothing but their wits, a pocket full of purloined sporks, and the uncanny human ability to stumble into and hopefully out of impossible situations, Sarah and Mike stepped out to face the galactic conclave. The moment they emerged from their ship, they were enveloped in a shimmering force field. A tall, willowy alien with iridescent skin stepped forward, its multifaceted eyes regarding them with a mixture of curiosity and disdain. I am Chief Security Officer Zlixix, it announced in a voice that sounded like wind chimes in a breeze. You have breached the most secure and sacred space in the known galaxy. Explain yourselves, strange creatures. Sarah cleared her throat. Well, you see, it's a funny story. We're humans from Earth and we were kind of imprisoned unjustly by some overzealous aliens, and then we escaped using cigarettes and sporks, you know what those are? No. Anyway, we stole this ship, accidentally activated some experimental drive, and... Here we are, she finished with a weak jazz hands gesture. Zlixix stared at them impassively for a long moment. Then, to everyone's surprise, it burst out laughing. The sound was like a thousand tiny bells being tickled by feathers. Oh, by the cosmic jellies, Zlixix chortled its body rippling with mirth. You must be the humans that Zeke's or Blacks warned us about. Sarah and Mike exchanged glances. You. Know about us, Mike asked cautiously. As Lix's laughter subsided to a gentle tinkling. Know about you? My dear primitive beings, you're the talk of the conclave. The humans who escaped the inescapable prison using primitive tools and unpredictable ingenuity. It's caused quite the stir, let me tell you. Sarah wasn't sure whether to be flattered or concerned. So, are we in trouble? Slixix waved a shimmering appendage dismissively. Trouble? Hardly. You're going to be the highlight of this conclave session. Come, come. Everyone will want to meet you. As the force field dissipated and Slixix ushered them towards a grand entrance, Mike leaned close to Sarah. I don't like this. It feels too easy. Sarah nodded. Agreed. Stay alert and keep those sporks handy. They were led through corridors that defied Euclidean geometry, past aliens of shapes and sizes that made Sarah's engineer brain short-circuit, and finally emerged into a vast chamber that could only be described as a cosmic United Nations on steroids. Thousands of alien delegates from every corner of the galaxy were seated in what appeared to be a massive amphitheater. As Sarah and Mike were led to the center stage, a hushed whisper rippled through the assembled beings. They a bulbous creature that looked like a sentient thundercloud floated forward. Welcome, 
humans it boomed in a voice that rumbled like distant thunder. I am High Counselor Nimbus. We have heard much about your exploits. Sarah stepped forward, trying to project confidence she didn't entirely feel. Thank you for having us, High Counselor. We apologize for our unexpected arrival. We're just trying to find our way home. Nimbus crackled with what might have been amusement. Yes, yes. After escaping imprisonment, stealing a ship, and activating an experimental drive that, by all accounts, should have turned you inside out and scattered you across seventeen dimensions. Mike shrugged. Just another Tuesday for us, really. This elicited a wave of murmurs from the assembled aliens. Nimbus's thunderous form roiled. Indeed. And therein lies our conundrum, humans. Your species has demonstrated a level of adaptability and unpredictability that is, quite frankly, alarming to many in the galactic community. Sarah's heart sank. This was starting to sound less like a warm welcome and more like a trial. Nimbus continued, some among us advocate for quarantining your entire species. Others suggest more, permanent solutions. Now hold on just a minute Mike started, his marine training kicking in, but Sarah put a hand on his arm. I counselor, she said, her mind racing, I understand your concerns. Humans can be challenging, but we're also curious, innovative, and eager to learn. We could be valuable allies if given the chance. A new voice joined the conversation, a familiar, gelatinous one. Valuable allies? Ha! Huh. They're menaces, I tell you. Sarah and Mike turned to see a very agitated Zeke's Orblax oozing his way to the center of the chamber, leaving a slimy trail in his wake. Oh, great, Mike muttered. Jello Odi Duty is back. Zeke's Orblax quivered with indignation. These humans turned my prison inside out. They caused millions of credits in damage, unleashed chaos throughout the facility, and worst of all, they stole all our sporks. This last accusation caused a gasp to ripple through the assembly. Apparently, spork theft was a serious offense in the galactic community. Sarah decided it was time for a different approach. She stepped forward, pulled a spork from her pocket, and held it up for all to see. Members of the galactic conclave, she announced, her voice ringing through the chamber, I hold in my hand a simple utensil. On our world, it's used for eating. But in our hands, it became a tool of liberation, a symbol of human ingenuity. She paused, looking around at the sea of alien faces and various other sensory appendages. Yes, we escaped your prison. Yes, we caused some chaos. But not out of malice. We did it because we believe in freedom, in justice, and in never giving up no matter the odds. Mike stepped up beside her. We humans have a saying necessity is the mother of invention when backed into a corner. We don't give up. We innovate. We adapt. We overcome. Sarah nodded. We don't want to be your enemies. We want to learn from you, to share our knowledge and our spirit of adventure. Imagine what we could accomplish together. The chamber was silent for a long moment. Then, from the back, a small voice piped up. Can you show us how to do the thing with the cigarettes and the force field? Before Sarah could respond, the chamber erupted into a cacophony of voices. Some were shouting about the dangers of unleashing humans on the galaxy. Others were excitedly discussing the potential applications of spork technology. I, Counselor Nimbus crackled loudly, restoring order. It seems we have much to discuss. Humans, you have given us much to consider. You will be our guests while the Conclave deliberates your fate and the future of human galactic relations. As they were led away to luxurious guest quarters, Mike turned to Sarah. Well. That could have gone worse. Sarah nodded, but her mind was already whirring with plans. Maybe. But we're not out of the woods yet. We need to figure out a way to contact Earth, warn them about the galactic community, and maybe smooth things over so we don't start an interstellar incident. Mike grinned. Just another day in the life of humanity's unofficial ambassadors to the galaxy, huh? Sarah laughed. Exactly. Now, let's see what we can do with the amenities in this room. I've got an idea involving the shower head, those glowing orbs, and yes, a couple of sporks. As they set about turning their luxury suite into an impromptu laboratory communication center, neither Sarah nor Mike noticed the small, spider-like drone watching them from a corner of the ceiling. Its single eye blinked once, twice, and then it scuttled away, unseen. In a hidden chamber deep within the conclave station, a group of shadowy figures watched the humans on a series of monitors. Fascinating, one of them murmured, its voice a sibilant whisper. Such primitive beings, yet so adaptable. Another figure, 
This one seeming to shift and change shape constantly, spoke up. They're dangerous, unpredictable. They should be contained before they spread through the galaxy like a virus. A third, its form hidden entirely in a swirling vortex of dark energy, laughed softly. Or, they could be useful. Imagine harnessing that chaotic creativity, that indomitable spirit. The first figure nodded slowly. Indeed, the humans have no idea, do they? They think they've stumbled into a simple galactic council meeting. Little do they know the shapeshifter chuckled. They're about to become pawns in a game that's been playing out for millennia. The dark vortex swirled in what might have been agreement. The question is, will they be our salvation or our doom? As the shadowy council continued their cryptic discussion, Sarah and Mike worked tirelessly in their room, blissfully unaware that their adventures were only just beginning. In the fate of humanity, and perhaps the entire galaxy, now rested on the shoulders of two humans armed with nothing but their wits, their ingenuity, and a pocket full of purloined sporks. As Sarah tinkered with what appeared to be a sentient lamp it kept trying to dodge her attempts to rewire it, Mike paced the room, occasionally pausing to examine the bizarre alien artifacts that decorated their luxury prison. So he said, picking up a crystal orb that hummed ominously when touched, what's the plan? I mean, aside from turning our five-star alien hotel room into a radio shack. Sarah grunted as she finally cornered the lamp, which let out a defeated flicker. Well, step one is to figure out a way to contact Earth. If we can warn them about the existence of the galactic community, maybe we can prepare humanity for whatever the conclave decides. Mike nodded, putting down the orb which seemed relieved. And step two, step two, Sarah said, a mischievous glint in her eye is to make sure that whatever the conclave decides, it's in our favor. Before Mike could ask how exactly they planned to influence a gathering of the most powerful beings in the galaxy, there was a gentle chime, and a section of the wall shimmered and dissolved, revealing a doorway. Standing there, looking like a cross between a praying mantis and a cocktail umbrella, was an alien they hadn't seen before. Greetings, humans, it said in a voice that sounded like wind through chimes. I am Xilith, junior adjutant to the Galactic Conclave. I have been assigned as your liaison during your stay. Sarah quickly kicked the disassembled lamp under a nearby hover couch. Ah, uh, hi there, Zilith. Nice to meet you. We were just admiring the decor. Zilith's compound eyes blinked in rapid succession. Indeed, the conclave spares no expense for its guests. There was something in the way it said guests that made Mike instinctively check for the reassuring shape of a spork in his pocket. So Sarah said, trying to sound casual, What's the word from the Conclave? Are they done deliberating our fate and the future of human galactic relations? Zilith made a gesture that might have been the alien equivalent of a shrug. The Conclave's debates are thorough. It may be some time before a decision is reached. In the meantime, I am here to answer any questions you might have, and to observe your behavior. Mike raised an eyebrow. Observe our behavior? What are we, lab rats? Oh no! Zilith said quickly, the lab rats are much better understood. You are an anomaly, a species that, by all galactic standards, should be confidently penned in its own solar system for at least another few centuries. And yet, here you are, having not only made contact with alien life, but having escaped from our most secure facility using, what was it again, cigarettes and spork Sarah supplied helpfully. Ah yes, Zilith's antennae twitched. The Conclave is most interested in these sporks. Perhaps you could demonstrate their use. Sarah and Mike exchanged glances. Well, Sarah said slowly, they're really just eating utensils. But in the right hands she trailed off, not sure how to explain that the real power wasn't in the sporks themselves, but in human ingenuity and adaptability. Xylith's eyes seemed to glitter with interest. Fascinating. And these cigarettes? Are they some form of primitive energy source? Mike coughed to cover a laugh. Yeah, you could say they give humans a certain kind of energy. Look, Xylith, not to be rude, but we're kind of in a situation here. Is there any way we could, I don't know, address the conclave again? Make our case. Xylith's antennae drooped slightly. I'm afraid that's not possible at the moment. The conclave is in closed session. However, it paused, looking around as if checking for eavesdroppers, then lowered its voice. There are some among us who are quite fascinated by your species. If you were interested in sharing more about human culture, human technology, human sporks, well, that information might find its way to sympathetic ears. 
Sarah's eyes lit up. This was an opportunity. We'd be happy to share. In fact, why don't you pull up a, uh, whatever it is you sit on, and we'll give you the full human experience. For the next few hours, Sarah and Mike regaled Exilith with tales of human history, achievement, and culture. They explained everything from the moon landing to the invention of the internet, from Shakespeare to memes. Silith listened with rapt attention, its antennae twitching with excitement at particularly interesting bits. And so Sarah said, wrapping up a simplified explanation of social media, that's how humans can instantly share information, ideas, and pictures of their meals with billions of others across the planet. Silith's compound eyes blinked rapidly, its antennae twitching in what seemed to be a mix of fascination and confusion. Remarkable. Your species voluntarily broadcasts personal information to unknown entities, and this is enjoyable. Mike shrugged. Well, when you put it like that, it does sound a bit weird. But hey, that's humanity for you. We're full of contradictions. Indeed, Zilith mused. Your species continues to confound our understanding. You possess technology capable of global communication, yet you used primitive smoking apparatuses and eating utensils to escape a high-security facility. You wage wars amongst yourselves, yet you speak of unity and peace among the stars. You are, as you say, full of contradictions. Sarah nodded, sensing an opportunity. That's what makes us unique, Sexilith. We're adaptable, creative, always pushing boundaries. Sure, we make mistakes, but we learn from them. We grow. We evolve. That's why we could be valuable allies to the galactic community. Zilith's antennae perked up. Allies. An interesting proposition. But surely you understand the Conclave's concerns. Your unpredictability makes you. Volatile. Mike leaned forward. Volatile, maybe. But also innovative. Think about it. We figured out how to escape an inescapable prison with just the stuff in our pockets. Imagine what we could do if we were working with you, not against you. Zilith was silent for a moment seemingly deep in thought. Then, it spoke in a lower tone. Your arguments are compelling. There are those in the Conclave who share your view, but others fear the chaos you might bring to the carefully balanced galactic order. Sarah's mind raced. This was their chance to sway the Conclave's decision. Zilith, chaos isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes, a little chaos is exactly what's needed to break old patterns and find new solutions. Humanity's history is full of examples where our chaotic nature led to our greatest achievements. Tell me more, Zilith said, its curiosity evident. For the next few hours, Sarah and Mike took turns regaling Zilith with tales of human ingenuity and perseverance. They spoke of the Wright brothers and the dawn of aviation, of Marie Curie and her groundbreaking work in radioactivity, of the space race that took humans to the moon. They explained how many of humanity's greatest inventions came from necessity or even mistakes penicillin, x-rays, the microwave oven. As they talked, Silith's posture changed. It leaned in, antennae twitching with excitement, occasionally making notes on a device that looked like a cross between a tablet and a kaleidoscope. Fascinating, Zilith murmured as Sarah finished describing how a failed attempt at making a super-strong adhesive led to the invention of post-it notes. Your species seems to thrive on what we would consider setbacks or failures. Mike nodded. That's the human spirit for you. We don't always succeed, but we never stop trying. And sometimes, our biggest failures lead to our greatest successes. Xylith was quiet for a moment, then said, I believe I begin to understand why some in the Conclave see potential in your species. Your chaotic creativity could indeed bring fresh perspectives to long-standing galactic issues. Sarah sensed they were on the brink of a breakthrough. Exelith, is there any way we could present this perspective to the Conclave? To show them that humanity's unpredictability could be an asset rather than a threat. Exelith's antennae drooped slightly. The Conclave's deliberations are closed. It would be highly irregular to it paused. Then its eyes seemed to brighten. Unless, yes, perhaps there is a way. Both Sarah and Mike leaned forward eagerly. We're all ears, Mike said. There is a tradition Zilith explained, rarely invoked, but still valid. If a species under evaluation can prove their worth through a practical demonstration of their unique abilities, they may be granted an audience with the full conclave. Sarah's eyes lit up. A practical demonstration. Like a test, Silith nodded, or at least made a motion that seemed equivalent. Precisely. If you could solve a problem that has long plagued the galactic community, 
using only your human ingenuity and the resources at hand. It trailed off suggestively. Mike grinned. Now you're speaking our language. What kind of problem did you have in mind? Zillit's eyes gleamed. There is a matter that has confounded our best minds for centuries. A planet in a nearby system, rich in resources vital to the Conclave, but completely inaccessible due to its extreme environmental conditions and hostile native life forms. Sarah's mind was already racing with possibilities. What kind of environmental conditions are we talking about? The surface temperature fluctuates between extreme cold and searing heat. The atmosphere is highly corrosive, and the native life forms are aggressively territorial. Mike whistled. Sounds like a real vacation spot. And you want us to figure out how to access this planet's resources? Silith nodded. If you could devise a feasible plan, it would demonstrate your species' problem-solving capabilities in a way the Conclave couldn't ignore. Sarah and Mike exchanged glances. This was their chance not just to prove humanity's worth, but potentially to secure Earth's safety and open up a new era of galactic cooperation. We'll do it, Sarah said firmly. But we'll need access to information about the planet, and maybe some basic equipment. Zillith's antennae twitched with what might have been excitement. I believe that can be arranged. I will return shortly with the necessary data and resources. As Xylith shimmered out of existence, presumably through some advanced teleportation technology, Sarah turned to Mike with a grin that was equal parts excitement and determination. Well, Mike, she said, pulling a spork from her pocket and twirling it like a baton. Looks like we've got another impossible problem to solve. You ready to show the galaxy what humans can do? Mike matched her grin, reaching for his own spork. Born ready. Let's save the world, scratch that. Let's save the galaxy. How hard can it be? As they began to brainstorm, bouncing increasingly wild ideas off each other, neither of them noticed the small, spider-like drone that had been observing their entire conversation from a corner of the ceiling. Its single eye blinked once, twice, and then it scuttled away, unseen, to report back to its mysterious masters. In the shadowy chamber deep within the Conclave Station, the hidden figures watched the humans with growing interest. It seems the sibilant voice whispered that our experiment is proceeding even better than anticipated. The shapeshifter chuckled, its form rippling. Indeed, these humans are proving to be even more entertaining than we hoped. The dark vortex swirled ominously. Let us see how they handle this challenge. It may well determine the fate of their species, and perhaps the future of the galaxy itself. As the shadowy council continued their cryptic observations, Sarah and Mike worked tirelessly, unaware that they were pawns in a game far larger and more complex than they could imagine. The fate of humanity hung in the balance, resting on their ability to solve an impossible problem with nothing but their wits, their ingenuity, and of course, a couple of trusty sporks. Little did they know, their spork-based solution was about to spark a chain of events that would reshape the cosmos in ways no one human or alien could have predicted.